I don't have a problem with homosexuality, though as I've mentioned before, I believe from an anthropological perspective, marriage should be strictly between a man and a woman. Those are my beliefs as a traditional conservative. It's what's worked for thousands of years for good reason. Marriage being a foundational cornerstone in the construction of a civilization and the matrimonial union between a man and a woman being the optimum means by which offspring can be raised. And of course, the sexual activity between a man and a woman being the only means by which said offspring can be conceived in the first place. A father and a mother provide very different and unique perspectives for a child's upbringing, and a child needs both. A father cannot replace a mother, and a mother cannot replace a father. However, in our world of postmodern deconstructionism, where everything goes and everything is patriarchal or sexist or racist or homophobic or something else, there is no difference between men and women, apparently. We're all born blank slates according to the cultural and moral relativist Marxists and sexually liberal gender reality-denying ideologues of our hedonistic and nihilistic modern Western world. When you begin to tear down the basis by which a society blossoms, i.e. the traditional heterosexual family unit, it's only a matter of time before all manner of depravity will become mainlined. Now, before any of my myriad of critics attempts to take me out of context for that last statement, the depravity I'm referring to is all the gender madness, like neutrality and pushing transgenderism on children and sexualizing kids too early in schools. I am not referring to homosexuality itself. I have no problem with gay people. Love the gays. I know that hardcore liberals want to conflate a conservative point of view against gay marriage as a hate-filled, bigoted, homophobic, neo-Nazi position, but not the case here. I'm not trying to take anyone's rights away from them. I also don't have a problem with a grown adult of sound mind and judgment deciding to transition from one gender to the other. So long as that gender is a real gender, like male to female or female to male, they feel that they align more to that gender. I don't believe in any other made-up genders. I'm actually pretty open about the trans thing. So, I don't think it's a decision a young child can consent to because it's a very dangerous choice to make at a young age. I think they need to be older. I think they need to be an adult, actually. I also believe that I, or the government, or anyone for that matter, nobody has the right to prevent two consenting adults from doing what they want to do. If two people of the same sex want to get married, who am I to stand in their way? It's none of my business. However, I believe civil unions should have been understood to be sufficient. Evidently, they weren't. I don't agree with the redefinition of marriage under the grounds that children deserve a mother and a father. Even Milo is against gay marriage for the same reasons that I am, but I guess that makes him the wrong type of gay. Does he have internalized homophobia or something? LGBT, by the way, does not equal gay people. It is an identity politics movement that's pushing an agenda in schools and politics. It attempts to speak on behalf of all gay people as a collective, in a similar way that feminism attempts to speak on behalf of all women as a collective, or Black Lives Matter attempts to speak on behalf of all black people as a collective. Gay people, no, sorry, a gay person is one individual. They do not need anyone else to speak on their behalf. They speak for themselves. If two people of the same sex are in love, I think that's great. I genuinely do. But the thing is, there are very important factors to consider when it comes to the institution of marriage. And I will get to that distinction later in the video, but for now, I will return to the agenda of the gender ideologues. What's the current focus for leftists? Sexualizing your children, of course. The mainstreaming of child abuse by means of making them confused about their gender identity from a young age through programs like Safe Schools in Australia and similar programs throughout the West. The Scottish Prime Minister pushing for two-year-olds to be given sex education. Ever heard of the Gendosaurus Rex? Children in Scotland are being encouraged to examine queerness and debate their gender under a taxpayer-funded program known as Gendosaurus Rex, according to the Christian Institute, a non-denominational Christian charity in the UK. Gendosaurus Rex is a project that looks into how gender, feminism, sexuality, queerness, and difference connect with live performances for kids, according to the website of Imaginate, the performing arts group that commissioned it. Kids of seven learn gender diversity from Safe Schools Coalition. Children as young as seven have been exposed to lessons about transgender experiences, with the Victorian head of the controversial Safe Schools Coalition admitting having taught the secondary school program in primary schools. In a lecture given by Safe Schools co-founder Roz Ward, which was captured via audio recording, she discusses an activity from the program's main teaching guide, All of Us, claiming 
I did this with a grade three class. It's a great activity if you ever want to do it, she tells the group of teachers. There's even a petition to try and ban the so-called safe schools programs in Australia because they're teaching the following to children. Gay and lesbian sex techniques, boys wearing girls' school dresses, chest binding for girls to inhibit breast growth, penis tucking, sex toy links, LGBT networks, fetish club links to children... This stuff is to be kept as far away from children as possible. It is completely inappropriate for a child's mind. They cannot comprehend this stuff. They're at a very vulnerable age where they can be taken advantage of by very perverted liberal school curriculums. On YouTube now, you've probably seen this. Queer kids stuff. LGBTQ plus content targeting children with sexual and gender related concepts beyond their age of understanding or reasoning. Completely inappropriate for kids. And in my view, YouTube should consider this age restricted. And most people agree with me here because their channel has been lambasted from all corners to such a degree they've had to disable their likes and comments. Blair White has done a very good video on queer kids stuff exposing it. So I suggest you check out that video to get her perspective. In Canada and Sweden, students are now being encouraged to choose their own made-up gender pronouns and even pick which bathroom they want to use each day. All of this madness and normalizing of gender confusion begins with the deconstruction and redefinition of the home and mother-father parental unit, the Judeo-Christian values that we once held to so dearly being jettisoned in favor of an anything-goes culture. In my own country in 2015, Irish people voted in a landslide victory for gay marriage to be made legal here. Now, as you know, I voted against it and we knew we were going to lose, though I don't think we knew we were going to lose so utterly. All the mainstream media and political establishment were in favor of this bill passing, so that's all you need to know. And it included rewriting our constitution. Furthermore, liberal Ireland desperately wanted a virtue signal in a major way to the rest of the world. To a certain extent, I can kind of understand where they were coming from. The Catholic Church in this country for many years was incredibly authoritarian, and of course, the horrific child abuse scandals were rife, not just in this country, of course. But long before this referendum, the church's grip had already weakened, and secularism had won the day. Nevertheless, the political pendulum had swung to such an extreme in the other direction, Irish people were determined to ensure that the church would lose further in order to distance themselves from it. The reality is the Catholic Church had changed and become quite modernized and is nothing like it once was. It's about the only remaining conservative institution left in this country and still prioritizes marriage and the conventional family unit. Also, if there had been a viable and well-funded no-vote campaign that was entirely secular, it might have won. But Irish people seemed to believe that voting no meant a victory for the Catholic Church. A kind of um, zero-sum game, if you will. It was a big mistake. Now, there are even gay people in this country who campaigned against gay marriage, and their voices were simply drowned out by the narrative that if you're against gay marriage, you're against equality, so therefore you're a bigot and a backward, out-of-touch dinosaur. It got ugly on social media, it got personal and quite hysterical. The marriage referendum has been like coming out all over again for me. But it's important to stand up and speak up for what I believe, because there are too many people being bullied into silence. I'm a gay man, and on May 22nd, I'll be voting no to same-sex marriage, because I believe children deserve a mother and a father where possible. For me, marriage is about children and the family, and not a way to measure adult relationships. I've been gay for as long as I can remember, and I grew up in an Ireland that was ferociously hostile. I am, as far as I know, the last person arrested under the 1867 Offences Against the Persons Act. Young, alone, terrified. That experience nearly killed me. Now, I'm being accused of being homophobic because I I'm against the redefinition of marriage. Yeah, I'm homophobic. I scream when I pass the mirror. For me, this referendum is not about equality for two main reasons. We already have civil partnerships in Ireland, and civil partnerships give gay couples protection and recognition. In fact, the ceremony is the same as civil marriage, right down to saying I do. If gay couples want constitutional protection, put civil partnerships in the constitution, but don't redefine marriage. A same-sex relationship is different to a marriage because marriage is, at its heart, about children and providing those children with their biological parents. Recognising difference is not discrimination. This referendum is about children because everyone knows marriage is almost always about children and because the government want to change the section of the constitution on the family. 
To have children, gay men like me need to either adopt or use surrogacy. Surrogacy turns children into commodities, putting adult desires above the rights of children, having babies made to order and wombs for rent. We're seeing in other countries how messy this can get, with surrogacy cases ending up in the court. And where are the child's best interests in that? If this referendum passes, we won't be able to privilege a mother and father model for a child in adoption. That's not fair, and we should vote no to that. If you approve the government's amendment, you will be saying that there is no distinction between the union of a man and woman and of two men or two women. There is a difference between our relationships and to pretend otherwise is wrong. It's not a matter of better or worse. It's a matter of recognizing difference and celebrating diversity. Saying that there is no distinction is ridiculous. There are many people who feel the same way as I do, but they're afraid to speak out because of the extraordinary bullying that's coming from the Yes campaign. The reason I'm bringing this up is not to really talk too much about gay marriage per se, but really once again about the indoctrination and sexualization of children. You see, many school teachers were very concerned at the time about this referendum because they believed it would radically alter the curriculum around sex education. And of course, that's what's happening in other countries, as I've said. This article is from just before the referendum last year in May of 2015. A group of teachers came forward to protest against a yes vote. The group invoked evidence from other countries where same-sex marriage was introduced, saying the teachers in particular came under severe pressure to totally change their teaching methods. Kevin Levy, a spokesman for the group, said, The reality is that if this referendum passes, gender-neutral marriage would be elevated to a new status in the Constitution and employees of the state would be obliged to protect that new model of marriage. As teachers, our fear is that, for example, a teacher who gives preferential treatment to a view of marriage as between a man and a woman over same-sex marriage, we will be seen as discriminating. He stated that the proposal will change the way that sex education classes in schools would have to be taught, and also claimed that teachers who do not believe that same-sex marriage is the same as marriage between a man and a woman could be accused of being homophobic in a breach of the Teaching Council Code of Conduct. Among other things, this advises teachers on how to teach children in junior infants about transsexuality and the different varieties of adult sexual desire before they know the basic facts of life. If the referendum passes, which obviously it did, it will become more and more difficult for teachers to refuse to teach material they believe is entirely age inappropriate. Again, queer kid stuff as a YouTube channel, entirely age inappropriate. I think you're seeing a pattern here. If the referendum is passed, far-reaching changes involved in the redefinition of marriage will create challenges for educators, which, in some cases, could lead to a loss of livelihood because of disciplinary action. It is highly unlikely that school ethos will provide sufficient protection, especially for teachers paid from the public purse. It is wholly unacceptable for the government to accuse people of scaremongering for raising these entirely legitimate concerns. The government has repeatedly refused to address any of these concerns and they are continuing to sidestep the issue at every turn. We're going to get into the reasons as to why they behave that way. In fact, they have refused to consider including a conscience clause. The impact on the education system in other countries after the introduction of same-sex marriage points to what would happen here. Of course, as we know, feminists have wanted to destroy the institution of marriage for a very long time. And effectively, by redefining it, they have done it severe damage here. They've kind of got what they wanted indirectly. Teachers and indeed parents have not been informed or consulted about these consequences. Accordingly, we urge parents and teachers to vote no. Sadly, it didn't work. In other words, what he's saying here is when you're teaching children about sex education with respect to a man and a woman, it's obviously about biological reproduction specifically. You don't go into sexual desire and lust and relationships because that would be psychological pedophilia. The child cannot appreciate what you're talking about. It's not appropriate and they should be kept away from these concepts for as long as possible. But when sex education is from a same-sex perspective, you have to drop the biological reproduction aspect of it because it doesn't apply. So what happens? What's left? Well, it becomes specifically about sexual lust, desire, sexual attraction, and things like that, sexual relationships. This stuff should not be taught to kids. This is a very good article from lifesitenews.com from last year. Ireland was the blueprint in terms of passing the gay marriage legislation. So here's an article that I think accurately sums up what happened. May 29th, 2015, massresistance.org. Last Friday's 62% vote in Ireland to legalize gay marriage has been hailed as a triumph of progressive thinking by the mainstream media and the political establishment. 
The outcome shocked many in the pro-family movement, but what the mainstream press isn't reporting is even more shocking. This culture war election was conducted under extraordinary conditions that have never been seen anywhere before in the West. As we described in our pre-election article, virtually all of the effort to pass gay marriage in Ireland came from massive funding from the United States, primarily a billion-dollar pro-gay foundation, Atlantic Philanthropies, in a sophisticated campaign spanning over a decade. Background, years of referendum losses by the LGBT movement. To understand how this Irish election was won, a bit of history from the US is in order. After the 2009 gay marriage referendum defeat in Maine, in the United States, the homosexual movement decided to craft an entirely new approach toward elections. They brought together groups of political strategists, psychologists, pollsters, organizing experts, and various think tank types. They meticulously studied the data and their election experiences and designed a new set of strategies and tactics to win against their right-wing adversaries. They created a sophisticated propaganda campaign. They shipped thousands of activists into key voting areas to canvas door-to-door in order to soften the average people toward homosexuality and create an animus against traditional religious values, they resurrected many of the big lie techniques used by the 20th century totalitarian movements. For example, people were told over and over that not allowing gay marriage was bad for the economy and that only backward, ignorant and superstitious people still were against it. Homosexuality was said to be the next phase of the civil rights movement, a key talking point was that by supporting gay marriage, you are on the right side of history, a Marxist concept. Ramping up for a nationwide gay marriage vote in Ireland. It's one thing to get a country's parliament to chip away at the moral underpinnings through legislation, but it's much different challenge to get a country with a thousand-year Catholic culture to accept gay marriage through a nationwide vote. So to take on the Irish election, the LGBT movement ramped up their effort tremendously over what they did for the elections back in the US. The total LGBT funding to achieve gay marriage in Ireland has been estimated at between $17 million and $25 million, roughly 50 times what was raised and spent by the pro-family side, i.e. the no side here in Ireland. Their execution was planned and focused rather than scattered and haphazard as our sides tend to be. The campaign, with lengthy and intense and expensive nationwide propaganda using psychological manipulation techniques to pound the entire country, the average person could barely grasp the force that was coming at them. The arguments were not rational or truthful, but completely emotional. People were told over and over that those who opposed gay marriage were opposed to democracy, that it will damage lives if they don't vote for it, that they're against human rights, will hurt Ireland's international reputation, will hurt Ireland's economy, are in favor of discrimination, are against love, are hateful and bigoted, are stupid and backwards. This all had a horrible effect on our side while galvanizing their supporters. It got to a point where people who persisted in holding these backwards beliefs were considered inferior humans by the supporters. One could literally lose his job over it as well. A particularly nasty venom was directed at religious believers and the Catholic Church. I observed this on social media and in the real world, by the way. Many of our people became frightened and confused while the other side became bolder and more vicious. Ireland gets a lesson in election mechanics. As the election neared, the polls showed a 78% yes vote coming up, but the homosexual movement knew they still weren't safe. Their brain trust realized early on that a great many people would simply go underground with their views and would vote their conscience on election day but would respond to pollsters in a politically correct manner. They also knew that the bulk of hardcore gay marriage supporters were young people who had a terrible record of voting or even being registered. They could still lose if those they really needed, those responding emotionally, didn't register or vote. So months before the election, with the help of the country's police force, they set up pro-gay marriage voter registration areas at college campuses. According to eyewitness reports, these booths illegally skipped required steps in the registration in order to process more people. Over 50,000 college students were registered in this manner, and others already registered were identified. In addition, according to reports, they also had paid canvassers to make sure that their likely supporters in the cities were registered to vote. Then on election day, using sophisticated social media and other techniques, they had the most massive get out and vote effort ever seen in Ireland. As a result, over 90% of known pro-gay marriage supporters voted and 95% of registered college voters, according to one report. Can you imagine if we were that organized for a referendum to leave the EU? <laughs> 
<laughs> On the other hand, many pro-family people were told feeling overwhelmed and beaten down by the psychological techniques used against them and with no overall get out and vote organization never made it to the polls. Nobody in Ireland had ever seen anything like this. There is no question that if the election had been conducted on an even playing field from the beginning, or even with a just a two-to-one funding advantage, the yes side would not have prevailed. As one Irish voter observed, if usual voting patterns had prevailed, this would have been easily defeated. The reason I'm making this video now, 18 months after the fact, is because it's become more clear to me now at this point, having seen the rise in things like safe schools type programs, and the far left's obsession with bringing sexual content into the schools, that the gay marriage conversation is really nothing more than a smokescreen, an attempt to indoctrinate children. From this, I think it's difficult to not observe a direct correlation between gay marriage being legalized and attempts by liberal educators, lobby groups, activists, and gender ideologues to introduce their own safe schools programs and brainwash children, particularly when you put this in the context of liberal cultural values being pushed over traditional conservative ones. I advise that you research RNK selection theory and Bill Whittle and Stefan Molyneux are good places to start because they've covered this subject quite considerably. From what we've learned from RNK selected groups with respect to the gene wars is that R selected strategists live in variable unstable habitats. They're very liberal, while Ks tend to be more conservative with respect to human beings. They choose stable environments, reproduce less often. They're capable of delaying gratification, something that the Rs just cannot do. They invest much more time in their offspring and make use of less resources. K-type personalities also are in favor of the free market and smaller government. They like rules, competition, and structure. Ors don't. Ors are completely different. They hate competition. Everybody's a winner at sports day. Everybody gets a medal. Or strategists have very low parental investment. They favor big government programs, more wealth redistribution. That's why feminists love it, because it removes the need for the husband in the household. Just consume resources from the state. The state is the father figure. Whenever you remove the father from the home, you just have a single mom, you create a broken home situation, the offspring become sexually active younger. This is true throughout the animal kingdom with respect to all our species. Humans are more complicated, but are no different. You look at John B. Calhoun's mouse utopia experiment, which it feels like we're living in right now. I made a video about this some time ago. The population rises to such a degree and resources are so abundant, the species becomes so decadent like we are, Predators are non-existent. There's no environmental challenges to overcome. It's a lot like the modern Western world. The population explodes, the family unit breaks down, and the offspring procreate more often due to low parental investment. So in short, social cohesion is lost in a society when you destroy the natural gender paradigm between men and women. And the left is doing this by destroying the family unit through redefinition of marriage. Now, gender is redefined, masculinity is considered toxic, men in the West seem more feminized than anything else, and women seem to be becoming more masculinized. This is the reason why liberals and conservatives can never truly reconcile. They're in direct competition for their own survival, and so ours know that in order to win the culture war, it needs to control the next generation. Through the school systems, via social justice and liberal indoctrination, it can produce more ours that way. The truth is, as observed through RK selection theory, if you want a stable, successful, prosperous society, you must choose to be K. The West needs to rediscover the traditional conservative values that built it. Otherwise, the unsustainable and short-term approach of our strategists will win out, and civilization will, like the mouse utopia experiment, simply collapse. I believe the government should be out of the marriage game entirely. It's a private contract after all, and by being part of the process it means that if a group complains loud enough, they can make the government force certain people's beliefs on other people, as Bill Whittle explains. You know what's interesting though? There's nothing about straight marriage in here either. And what that tells me is, is that the government, especially the federal government, shouldn't have anything to do with this because marriage is not a right. We have a list of rights. And marriage isn't one of them because marriage isn't a right. Ultimately, when you get right down to it, marriage is a contract. And when you take the coercive force of the government and you get it into deciding for half of the country, you put half of the country's beliefs forcefully on the other half, no matter which side of the argument you on, when you get that kind of coercive effort to make the government tell people what to believe, you get into real trouble. So I maintain that the answer to the gay marriage problem is just to get the government out of the marriage business completely. What does that mean? 
Well, it means that if a church chooses to marry a gay couple, if the church wants to marry two men or two women, if the church together with their pastor decide that they want to have a gay marriage ceremony, then that should be fine. I know that offends a lot of people out there, but you don't have a right not to be offended in this country. However, however, if a church chooses not to marry a gay couple, then that's got to be fine too, and for the same reason, because other people are offended, but they don't have a right not to be offended either. See, the only actual right in this entire discussion is the right to follow your own religious beliefs without interference or coercion on the part of the government. It's right here. That's why it's the very first words in the Bill of Rights. The very first words in the Bill of Rights to the Constitution of the United States of America say, Amendment 1, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The reason those are the first words in the Bill of Rights is because when the government gets in the business, not only of telling people what to do, but telling people what to think or believe, well then only one group of people are going to benefit, and that's not gay people, it's the government. Next question. I would also add to that, it's not just the government who wins, but the radical leftist agenda groups, liberal gender ideologues, social justice warriors, and the activists pushing for this legislation to pass so that they can introduce whatever the hell kind of insanity into the school systems they want and into wider society. By the way, I wouldn't be against gay marriage if it didn't legally redefine the family unit, but it does. So to conclude my argument, the problem is not homosexuality, as my critics are going to try to misrepresent me as saying, yeah, Dave's blaming the gays. Nope. The problem is that the institution of gay marriage is a Trojan horse being used as a means to redefine the family unit by radical leftists in the most authoritarian way possible. Once they've done this, the state, like all Marxist philosophies, becomes the family unit, going so far as to try to ban the terms mother and father, and the state, as we've seen, is pushing weird and totally age-inappropriate content into the minds of young children in schools. That was my argument. Thank you very much for watching. It was heavy going, and I'm well aware of the criticism that I've now opened myself up for. But there you go. We can't agree on everything. Take care, guys, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.